welcome to the channel and today we're going to take a look at um the boy in the box trial now i'm fascinated with this trial uh tim ferreter and his wife are both uh being charged with child abuse and uh, another assortment of crimes but tim ferreter rejected a plea deal and opt to go to trial and if he's found guilty i believe he can spend up to 40 years in prison now him and his wife are being tried separately but i've got some highlights here because a lot of the trials are just super long right it's just like oh man six seven eight hours of so i've kind of dipped through um and tried to grab highlights so we can condense this down to where it's not really long and everybody just falls asleep so i've got a few opening statements from the defense and we'll take a listen to some of the opening statements of the prosecution now i'm not going to play them all i mean the defense's opening statement is like 20 minutes long and the prosecution is it's pretty lengthy as well <clears throat> so we're just going to get a little bit of the highlight so you get a taste of the basis of their case i mean within the first three or four minutes of each of the opening statements you've got an idea of where they're going to be uh projecting their case against against tim ferreter i've also got some clips of uh colleen mccoy she was one of the boys teachers and wade myers he is the psychiatrist and it's like okay is he a bad are they bad parents or is he just a bad kid right what and listening to some of the testimony uh especially from the defense on cross is just mind-boggling uh some of the questions he asked them but i haven't listened to the teacher's uh statement yet um i've got it pulled up but i haven't i haven't browsed through it uh i have through wade myers uh he's the psychiatrist now i have wade through some of his stuff and it's it's pretty interesting all right so we're going to start out uh with the defense's opening and we're going to let it run for a few minutes and if you're interested and want to hear the whole thing um I'll try to get those links in the description for you. Here we go. It is a parent's responsibility to make She's away from the mic. Tough choices to protect their child. Tough choices to protect their other children. And tough choices to protect the community. And that is what Tim Barrett did in this He was faced with an impossible situation. And he made tough choices to protect Ronan, or Ty is what we will call him throughout this trial, from himself, from the other children in his home, and from the community. You only have to make one determination in this case, and that is whether or not Tim Ferreter had the criminal intent necessary. That's it. Did he or did he not have the criminal intent? And that will be your guiding question throughout this case. This case is not about whether or not Tim Ferreter made the right choice. Because I will be the first to tell you, the defense will be the first to tell you that he did not. But what it is about is the difficulty of parenting, right? Because bad parenting does not make somebody a criminal. Bad parenting does not mean that a person should be charged with a crime. It makes them human. It makes them a parent who is trying to figure out when faced with a child, as, as you'll hear throughout the trial, who has consistent and escalating behavioral issues, how to handle them. You will learn more throughout the trial, but I want to try in these next uh, few minutes to share with you what that relationship looked like. 
Okay. That's giving you a basis of how the defense is, is going to attack this. Well, you know, they just made bad choices. I mean, she didn't just come out and say, yeah, well, they stuck him. Uh, yeah, they made bad choices. They stuck him in a box, put him in the dark for hours. But, you know, it doesn't make them bad. Okay. So there you have it. That was the defense's opening statement. So now we're going to take a look at the prosecution, and this is a little bit of her opening statement. Course of this week, you're going to hear a lot and get to know a lot about the life. She's of away from the mic. Ronan Ferrer. He goes by Ty, and today he is 16 years old. But this case starts, and really the focus of what his life was like is how his life was in or end of December 2021 and January of 2022 when he was just 14 years old. This morning, you're going to learn that on January 28th, 2022, he ran away from home. He lived in Jupiter, Florida at that time with his parents, the defendant, Tim Ferreter, and his mom, Tracy Ferreter. You're going to hear that Ronan was adopted as a child, as a small child, a toddler age from Vietnam, and he had lived with the Ferreters since that time. He was the second of their four children. He has an older sister named Fiona, who you're also going to get to hear from at this child, uh, during this trial, a younger sister named Nola, and a much younger little brother named Pierce, who was about three years old when all of this happened. And in January of 2022, he was a student at Independence Middle School and 14 years old. You're going to hear on the 28th, he didn't, he ran away from home. He was reported missing to the Jupiter Police Department, and that's where this case starts. You're going to hear from Jupiter Police Department officers who are going to tell you that they um, took the report of a missing child and that he didn't come home on the next day on the 29th, and he also still was not located on the 30th. They went back to the Ferreter residence to find out if there was new information. Had he come home? Was there any leads? Um, the day he left was a Friday. Still wasn't there on Saturday. And on Sunday, Detective Sharp from the Jupiter Police Department went into the Ferreter home with Tracy Ferreter. You're going to hear it's at that point that for the very first time he learned about how Ronan was living, about what his living situation was like at home with his parents. He's gonna tell you that he was shown the house and the first thing that stood out to him was that the child who they were looking for didn't have a place to sleep in the main house. There wasn't a bedroom for him, there weren't his items of clothes, there weren't his toys inside of the house. Instead, there was a structure, a small room box-like structure that was constructed in the garage that didn't have any windows. It had a box spring and a mattress, a bucket in the corner, and a desk. You're gonna hear that um, at that point, the child still wasn't found, and so Ann, Detective Sharp left and continued the investigation. And the next day, which is Monday, January 31st, he, Ronan shows up at his school. And there he is um, made secure, made safe by the Jupiter Police Department. And that's when the criminal investigation really starts, after they had the opportunity to speak to him. You're going to hear that as part of the investigation during that initial walkthrough of the room, Detective Sharp realized that that small cell-like room had a ring camera in the corner to observe the occupant of the room. And so as part of his investigation, he served a search warrant to the Ring Corporation to see if they had maintained any videos. And you're going to get the opportunity to see and hear that evidence that was returned. Okay. So that's the prosecution's just a smidgen of her opening, which gives you a clear rundown of how they're going to attack this, where, you know, the police come over there and see, you know, they're going to find all this footage from this camera. They're, you know, seeing that he's been locked in there, he crying, they cut the light out, the dad screaming at him, all kinds of stuff. Um, and that is the prosecution's opening statement, just 
giving a foundation. And of course, she goes on to say things like, you know, this is abuse and all this kind of stuff. So I'm going to try to get all these links into the description so you guys can go watch the full thing. So I can just kind of cram this stuff in here right now. Just give it a rundown. Okay, so this is the former teacher. She's claiming that uh, the boy humiliated his sister, the, the boy who's the alleged, well, he's not alleged. He was a victim of child abuse. He was the one locked in. So, um, let's see here. Okay, now this is the defense uh, uh, cross and examining her. And this is during the defense's, uh, the, the prosecution's already rested at this point. So she's uh, witnessing for the defense. And let's, let's see what she's got to say. 2018-19, um, were you working as a teacher? Yes. Okay. How, long, how long were you teaching? At that point in time, maybe four, four or so years. And what, what city did you live in at that time? Tucson, Arizona. What school did you, did you teach at? Immaculate Heart Academy. Now, he's being tried because he was locked in a box in Florida. Now, before they moved to Florida, they were in Arizona. Uh, I should have told you that. My apologies. So she was a teacher when they lived in Arizona. was uh immaculate heart is is that a um is that a private school public school private okay and what grades did you teach back then i taught second grade third grade and fourth grade consecutively 18 19 school year what what grade were you teaching um, I'm not certain. It was either third or fourth grade. All right. So, do you know, um... Yes. Okay. And how do you know her? She was a student of mine. And do you remember when that was? 2019. In 2019? I believe 2019. Okay. Was there ever um, some moment where into your classroom and asked you to make an announcement? Do you recall that? Yes. Do you recall when that was approximately? Can you repeat that question? Sure. Do you recall when approximately what month and year that happened? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember for sure. Maybe February of 2019 or March. All right. And would it help if to refresh your recollection if you had something to look at from from that time? Yes. So. Early came into my classroom and asked if he could make an announcement to my class, which at that point in time, it was a regular thing for teachers to send students to other classrooms to make announcements. So I said, yes, you can make an announcement to the class. So he walked to the front of the class and started to say things where I quickly realized he was not sent by another teacher. He to humiliate her in front of the whole class. He made her cry. And once I caught on to this wasn't to the fact that he was not making an announcement sent by another teacher, I stopped him and I asked him to go back to his own classroom. And, and did he leave? Yes, he did. Uh, did you know Ola? Yes, she was very, very upset. She was crying, and um, it took a while for her to gain her composure. Uh, 
what what was your impression of of that whole incident? I'm sure Objection. sustained. <clears throat> had had you My had you ex I'll I'll ask another question. Had you ex ever had something like that happen in your class before? Objection. Relevant. Sustained. Based on what happened, did you do anything next? Did you reach out to the parents? Yes, I did. And I sent them an email. Okay, this is the fence. I, I didn't know. I hadn't seen this clip. Um, and plus, they, they muted what the boy said, which I was curious on what did he say to make his sister upset walking in her class. <clears throat> but this is just a defense laying a foundation. He's just a bad kid. Like it's going to change the jury's mind that the parents should lock him in a box because he's being a, a little douchebag, right? Okay, this next clip is um, the prosecution is um, ex it's still their case. I believe it's still their case in this, this one. Whatever. They're Exam cross examining him. Uh, the Wade Myers, he's a psychiatrist, and they're laying down some good foundation for the jury on, <laughs> on this. So, here, let's take a listen. Do this type of uh, treatment of a child can it stunt their intellectual growth? Yes, it can. Can it stunt their psychological growth? It can, yes. Is there um, a reasonable likelihood uh, when a person engages in this type of behavior towards a child that there is going to be psychological injury or mental injury as a result? You said, is there a... Is there, is there a likelihood? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, uh... This line of question is just hammering it home of the prosecution's laying out Boom, boom, boom. Is this, should they be doing this? Is this going to cause these problems and all of this stuff for, for this kid? Should the parents have done this? They're defuting the defenses. Well, let's minimize. <laughs> it's just powerful stuff. A substantial likelihood. Now, in this case, did you see, based on the evidence that you were able to review, is there a pattern of isolation of the child? Yes, it's uh, he, he for nearly three years was isolated in the cell uh, for the better part of each day. I, I, as far as hours, it sounds like when he wasn't at school, let's say he's at school for eight hours, he's then in the box for 14, 16 hours a day. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> the jury just heard that. He's in the box. That was just, wow, devastating. That Just that little piece right there was devastating against the defense. Now. On a daily basis, so yeah, a very, uh, uh, very much established pattern. Did you, and I think you say isolation, is it fair to say that there is also a pattern of confinement here of the child? Yes, they're essentially one and, one and the same in, in this case, it would seem. Is there, were you able to observe a pattern of a deprivation of the child? Uh, uh, yes, uh, there was a, a emotional uh, deprivation, there was physical depri deprivation, there was intellectual or cognitive deprivation where he wasn't uh, really provided much in the way of anything to stimulate his, his mind or to entertain himself. I mean, Is isolation, confinement, and deprivation considered an acceptable way to punish a child? No, it's, it's not. It's, it would be counter-therapeutic to uh, disciplining a child. But we're not talking about a, um, a five-year-old who might have a temper tantrum and you want to give them a timeout for five minutes in their room. I mean, this, that, that's something. That timeouts are an accepted form of, of discipline. So does it... This is almost like uh, torture, like war. Prisoners. Put them, put them in a room... I mean, it, I mean, he did have a mattress, but for Pete's sake, he had a bucket to go to the bathroom in. 
that's what he had was a bucket make a difference in your opinion the duration of the isolation confinement and duration and deprivation oh, it's a huge difference sure if it's uh, if it's a short duration for younger children it can it can be uh, appropriate but again I'm talking in, in terms of minutes uh, not hours but in, in terms of doing it every day day after day for most of the day there's there's just no comparison to, a, a, say, a short time out with a younger child. And e Here's an audio clip of uh, that they got from the ring camera because there was a camera in the in the room that was uh, the 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 eight by eight room was built in the garage and they had a ring camera in there. And this is some of the audio from it. That the that the. Uh maybe i got the wrong clip hold up all right we got the clip now here we go this is a clip of um from the ring camera you want to take this thing to the next level let's do it let's do it four two let's do it four two let's go and then he slams out turns out the light and you hear the boy crying alone in the dark he's afraid of of another uh, abusive episode occurring or, or being harmed or he said he was even afraid of, of being killed. Dr. Wade Myers testified for the state after watching the videos. We're not showing them. Wow. That's crazy. That's just insanity. All right. This is day three of the trial and this is uh, the defense cross-examining uh, Dr. Wade Myers, the psychiatrist. And I couldn't find somebody who had already clipped the highlights of the defense. I only found highlights of the prosecution uh, examining the psychiatrist. So I've had to come to the end of this one. So I'm going to try to get the best ones right here, which I found were, were really good. So here we go. Was that the, that the, uh, that Tim Ferrer, his conduct was malicious. Remember that? I do, yes. So my understanding is malicious means wrongful, intentional, without legal justification, uh, something where the... Uh, that a reasonable parent would not have engaged in that conduct towards a child for any valid reason, and that the primary purpose of the act was to cause the victim unjustifiable pain and injury. Is that, is that what you meant by malicious? The objective to improper opinion legal um, Overruled, you can answer, sir, if that's what you meant. That, I, I wouldn't have probably given that definition verbatim but that seems to describe it yes okay mean cruel uh, not called for uh, inappropriate potentially uh, harmful uh, or, or even life-threatening and and malicious is um, is it in the is it well, let me ask you a question what is the DSM 5 the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and it's the fifth edition. It's been around since, I believe, 1952. It's produced by the American Psychiatric Association, and it attempts to list every mental disorder that can affect human beings. And it's got hundreds of diagnoses in it, and it has descriptions and, and the criteria you would need to meet each of those diagnoses. Uh, and and is, is malicious a diagnosis in the DSMV? DSM-5? No. No. Okay. So malicious is not a psychiatric diagnosis by you, correct? Correct. Okay. It's, it's, your, it's really a lay opinion, correct? Because it's not a psychiatric opinion, which is what you're an expert at, correct? It's, it's a reflection on uh, personality traits. But since it's not in the dsm 5 it's fair to say it is not a psychiatric diagnosis, and that is your area of expertise, right? Well, human behavior would be my area of expertise as well, and, and personality. So I don't think you answered my question. So the question is that malicious, not being in the dsm 5 and therefore not being a psychiatric diagnosis to 
opine that someone's malicious would not be a psychiatric opinion, correct? He is grasping for straws here. I mean, everybody knows what malicious means. And you're trying to discredit the psychiatrist because he used the term malicious and that it's not in the the scale of when they're doing a psychiatric diagnosis. It's just his opinion. And it's a pretty darn good opinion. It would not require your specialty, correct? That was that's correct. Okay. So that opinion is you as a layperson. That's your opinion, just as like it would be mine or Anyone in the audience? No, I'm making a, a clinical uh, assessment of, of a parent's behavior towards their child. It's a clinical uh, observation uh, based on, on video evidence, based on other evidence, and based on uh, working with abused children my entire career, as, as well as abuse, uh, abusive parents. And malicious may be an adjective in the DSM, I don't know. We'd have to look in the index. I it may be relating to, related to certain disorders. I looked at it. I couldn't find it. But if you find it, please let me know. So, sustained juries instructed to disregard counsel's comments about his efforts at finding it in the DSM manual. And that jury is not going to disregard that. They probably know, just like us sitting here watching this, that guy's grasping at straws. But you're making a, a, a mountain out of a molehill about, he used the term that the parents were malicious in their actions of throwing the boy in, putting him in a box for Pete's sake were uh, incidences on January 29th of 19 February 15th of 19 February 28th of 19 March 8th of 19 March 16th of 19 March 22nd of 19 March 27th of 19 April 5th of 19 at the school, correct? Yes. Okay. And at each time, in each of those incidents, it ranged from some injury to another student to some property damage or theft, correct? No. One of them is he had, I believe, green sprinkles in his possession. Uh, another one was he, he took some snacks from another student. Another one was he was found in possession of a, of a Texas Instruments a calculator. Another one was he did something to a computer regarding the coding or something. He was trying to get to a game on that computer. And then there's a, he had a, the one we talked about already, we had a fight with a, a boy on the playground. I mean, they threw some punches. Uh, and then, an, let's see, another one was uh, he kicked a, a ball at another student a few, uh, multiple times. And then, so uh, how was that I didn't see well? where anybody was, was injured or hurt. I mean, and, and some, uh, many of the, these are regarding uh, items he had in his possession or, or uh, messing with the computer or having uh, sprinkles. Sprinkles, which he had stolen, right? Those were not his sprinkles. Correct. Right. I'm not sure where he got the sprinkles. I'm going by the, the documents you reviewed. And when you're saying not injured, isn't there literally on the February 28th, 2019, where the note says he has an ongoing, this is an ongoing pattern of injuring children at recess. Correct? If, if it says that, yes. You can look at it. It's in front of you. I said theft, you said, well, he was just found with a Texas Instruments calculator. That was a stolen calculator, correct? The, the parents are the ones. It was ones. not his. That's correct. The parents found it and contacted the school to say he's got this calculator. It's not his. Right. I believe that's right. And the school said, oh, we've been looking for that. It's another student. Sustained. So you'd agree that this, this, the of the incidents, we have injuring other children, we have theft, correct? We have those two so far? Yes. All right. And it's appropriate for parents to 
react to that in a way to try and curb that type of behavior of their child, correct? The psychiatrist's response here is epic. Depends on how they react. But yes, they should, they should uh, deal with it appropriately, yes. And we went through the medical records already, but at this time, he's already been seeing a therapist. He has also seen uh, a psychiatrist, Dr. Rickenbacker, at this point already. And this conduct continues to happen, correct? Well, you're bringing up a lot of things from uh, 2019, and that's around the time he was put in the box. So how much of this is, is acting out from being put in the box? Well, it would be my first question. Because so, you do document a, a, a blip up, a, a, a increase in his uh, behavior issues at school. Well, I went. Oh, my God. Bam. Bam. <laughs> he has an uptick because he's put in a box is probably why he was behaving this way. And through before the other, with, I went through all of the records before that as well. And we can keep going through records in 2018. I could do those too. And you have them. And if you want, we can go through 2018. Sustained. Well, are, is it your position that, that this acting out that I just went through in 2019 did not occur in 2018? Uh, we talked about some of the things that happened before. Like the boy who kicked him on the on the field, and then he he punched the boy, and then the, the Legos incident, and the finger and thumb incident. Yes. Okay. So there were things in 2018 as well. Yes. Going from February of 2018 all the way to December of 2018. I have October of 18, but maybe there was one in December that I didn't document. Um, him being in essentially solitary confinement, correct? Yes. So it's your position that he was in, that he was in that room 14, to 16 hours on a daily basis. This is really good testimony right here. Really good. Yes. It's it's not my position. It's what the the records reflect. Which records? All, all of them are put together. <laughs> CPT records, uh, po police interviews, uh, co collateral interviews. Uh, for instance, what uh, what uh, um, t uh, said. You testified on direct, you reviewed 40 videos, ring videos, correct? About that, yes. And that's out of approximately 21,000 ring videos, correct? I don't know how many there were. I know there was a whole lot of uh, many, many videos. So the 40 that the state selected to give you are the ones you reviewed? Correct. And it is your opinion from the review of those 40 videos is that where you get your 14 to 16 hours on a daily basis that he's in his room? I, I, we're talking about January, uh, right? January of 22. Uh, yeah. This is where the, the defense is driving is that, okay, so the, the psychiatrist is saying, yeah, he's in there 12, 15 hours a day, but what the defense is trying to establish is, well, if he was just in there a little less, it wouldn't be so bad. How are you getting these numbers? I, I don't know why he would go with this line of questioning, but it's not hurting. I mean, it's not hurting the prosecution, and it's definitely destroying the defense. Yes. Okay. That's where you get that information from the ring videos. I just don't know the basis. No, of I didn't. I didn't get it from the ring videos. No, but the ring videos corroborate that uh, history. That he would be woken up in the morning. Uh, he'd be asked, "Is it dirty?" referring to the plastic bucket. Oh my God. Uh, then I believe he was allowed to go out to the, to the bathroom. Then he'd go back in the box and then the mother would take the children to school and then she would come get back, uh, come back and get him around nine. 
and then he would go back in the box after school, say, I don't know, 430, whatever the math would be. Are you aware of that? Oh, my God. I mean, he just hammered that home by repeating. He's in the box. She gets him up in the morning, gets out of the box. Then he gets back in the box. She comes home. I mean, how many times is he going to say he's he been put back? That boy been put back in the box. That just, to me, that was devastating testimony. It's uh, 4.30 p.m., of course. So I, I just, I'm trying to understand the basis of where you're getting that number. That's all. So I, I said, it, is it from the 40 videos? You said it's not just from that. It's from the record. So what, what are you talking about? Where do you, where do you get that from? You said the CPT. That was one thing you said. So somebody in, who in the CPT said that? CPT record. Uh, okay. He said he was in there 14 to 16 hours per day. What I had was a ballpark of when he left the house, when he was let out of the box, and then when he got home from after school, when he was put in the box. Oh, my God. And then he was kept in the box, my understanding, almost every night fed in the box after everybody else had ate. And then he stayed in the box throughout the night until he was let out in the morning. So if you add up the hours, it's probably, uh, I don't know, even if you went 5 o'clock to, to midnight, that's 7. Then midnight to 8 is 8, so that's 15 hours. Oh, my God. Bam. I'm, I'm just ballparking it. I don't have an exact number of hours. If I were to um, tell you that uh, that... If the, if the evidence were to show that it is no more than 10 hours. Okay, here it is. This is the highlight, and then we're going to wrap this up. This question right here blew my mind. And it's like, why would the defense do this? I mean, I'm not an attorney. I'm just a spectator. I'm one of the jurors, just like you guys. Just let me know what you think about this line of questioning right here. Like, to me, this is the highlight of this whole video. For me, this was, like, the most interesting and devastating testimony. of the, and, and plus the line of questioning from this defense attorney. All right, let's do it. Hours a night. And at most, on occasion, a three-hour block during a day. Would that change your opinion in any way as to whether or not, uh, and I, I'm not sure what your, your opinion was here, whether or not it was malicious? Any amount of solitary confinement for hours to me is, is unacceptable. There's no justification for it, and it's, it's cruel. Okay. So it wouldn't change your opinion? No. No. So the lessening of hours wouldn't change your opinion? No. How? Oh. Okay. And so if, uh, if I were to tell you that... Uh, Let him finish the question before you make your objection. Go ahead, Mr. Wright. Go ahead. If I were to tell you that, hypothetically, that, there, uh, that he was uh, out with family on various occasions, he participated in... Uh, Communal community events or any of those types of things, would that change your opinion in any way? Oh my God! I, I'm aware of those of those episodes of being out out and about. So no, I've, I've already taken those into consideration. If I were to tell you that he um, okay, he's not going to stop. He's going to continue to ask him hypothetically. And we took him to McDonald's one day, but then we brought him back and put him back in a box. Would that change your mind? It's like, why? Why is he giving this line of questioning? I don't get it. I mean, I guess they don't have any other defense. How can you defend the, the defenseless? I, I, he, how can you defend these people? You know, they're just locking their boy up in a box for Pete's sake. Was uh, provided a a breakfast every morning 
from his mother, would that change your opinion in any way? I'm, I'm aware of, of that already, except there were some mornings he didn't get breakfast, and it's on the ring video as well, him, him being hand, handed, uh, say, a banana with, uh, with some peanut butter on bread. And a banana with peanut butter on bread is not breakfast in your opinion? I didn't say that, no. Okay. So he was, you said he was not given breakfast, he was handed a banana with peanut butter on bread. That's what you just said. No, I said some days he did not get breakfast. Okay, and then other days he got, as you said, a banana with peanut butter on bread. My understanding, most days he was given breakfast. So, on direct, by the way, you had said that the, you spoke to the issue of the banana with peanut butter on bread uh, in the context of torture. Is it your opinion that it's torturous to get a banana with peanut butter on bread for breakfast? This questioning is so stupid. No. Okay, because I'm a big fan of banana and peanut butter mix. So. I am too. Okay. And is it, is it your opinion, or would it, would it change your opinion if you saw videos of eating dinner outside his room during oh that God. January of 22 time period? He said that on three inst instances, he did have dinner with the family outside of the cell in January. So about one out of every whatever it would be, 10 days, he ate with the family dinner. And is, and he, did he, and would it change your opinion if going to the breakfast that he had breakfast outside his room out in the, in the kitchen? I, I didn't, I don't recall seeing information on how often he was out for breakfast. My impression was from reading all the materials that he didn't go out for breakfast or very rarely. Would it change your opinion if there were videos with him sitting sitting on the couch watching TV with his dad? My opinion about you, the okayness of solitary confinement? No. Oh. No, but I know that at times he was out of his cell and, and spent some time in the house with, with the family. Out of the cell. Oh, that hurt. That hurt. Oh. That whole question was stupid. That whole line of questioning. You are not going to get that man to change his mind on whether or not it's okay to confine that boy. I know this video is long, but it's so good. Um, This is the last clip, and this is... The end of the trial, and listen to what the defense attorney says. Hopefully I've got the right clip. Here we go. All right. The defense is going to make a motion. At this time, we're going to move for our first judgment of acquittal. Uh, essentially, the well, the, obviously, there's there's three counts here. The aggravated child abuse count has um, five different ways that it can be proven by the state: either aggravated battery, willful torture, maliciously <laughs> punished willfully or unlawfully caged, finally knowingly, willfully committed child abuse, and in doing so caused great bodily harm, disfigurement, or, um, sorry, permanent disfigurement. The state in this case, I think, has failed to prove that Mr. Ferreter willfully, intentionally inflicted any physical, mental injury that resulted in great bodily harm. What? The terms great bodily harm Permanent disfigurement, these come from the aggravated battery statute. There have, has been, as far as I can recall, no testimony that the child suffered great bodily harm, uh, which means uh, distinguished from slight, trivial, minor, moderate harm, and as such does not include mere bruises, which were also not presented. Well, he clearly suffered mental harm. 
I mean, the whole mental of being shut up in a box and the light turned out. Likewise, there's no testimony that this child was in any way disfigured. Aggravated child abuse is committed through other ways as well, of course. Malicious punishment is reserved for certain types of cases. In Florida, Wheeler versus State controls in this district. It's 203 Southern 3rd 1007. In that case, uh, the, the rule that comes from that case is that great bodily harm or permanent disabilities or disfigurements are what demonstrate actual malice on the part of a parent and not merely a monetary, sorry, momentary anger or frustration. So the state, I think, has failed to prove actual malice. Mal malicious, there's a definition for malicious in the jury instructions, wrongfully, intentionally, without legal justification or excuse Maliciousness can be established through circumstances, and one could conclude that a reasonable parent could have engaged or not engaged in that conduct, depending on those circumstances. A reasonable I think a motion for JOA at this stage, doesn't the state get the benefit of all favorable inferences? And so if, if I were to buy your argument there, at this stage, I would have to conclude that they have established malice. Well, I do think that um, I think actual malice, though, under Wheeler is that it's not any sort of a momentary anger or frustration. It's uh, discipline that results in great bodily or permanent disabilities and or disfigurements or demonstrates that He's the actual malice on the part of the parent was not momentary anger or frustration. So I don't know that we have any evidence of that. I haven't seen any evidence of that. Uh, what the state is essentially relying upon factually from that perspective is moments where he comes in, he's yelling at, and those interactions that we saw this afternoon on the video, those fit more frustration and, and anger, if anything, but not great bodily harm. But we're talking about malice, and we're talking about intent, right? I mean, that's the purpose that you're making this argument at this stage, right? No, well, I'm going under the of the five ways to prove child abuse. Of them, I'm going through them. So there's, I'm saying it's not aggravated battery. I'm saying it's not uh, malicious because we don't have great bodily harm. Uh, I'm, I also believe it's not um, torturous. I don't think there's any facts to go to torturous. Oh my gosh. And I think that the closest call here would be for the state is caged. So you are, you, you're trying to convince the court at this point that no r jury could ever find that being confined in a eight by eight room or box, whatever you, however you want to refer to it, that no jury on earth could find that to be torturous? Because I really have to find that no reasonable jury could conclude that um, that that was torturous under the facts that had been presented, um, again, which is why at this stage the, um, the state gets the benefit of all favorable inferences. Is that the, the leap you're asking the court to make at this point? The torture involves extreme or sadistic conduct, which is absent here. Uh, well, I, 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 I'm going to push back on that. I don't know that it's absent. I, 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 what I believe is that there's certainly enough for a jury to determine whether it's torturous, evil, or sadistic. I mean, there, the, the video displayed many repetitive instances of the father coming into the room, um, his son snapping to attention uh, in demonstrable fear, uh, a co repetitive, consistent berating uh, of the child. Um, it seems to me, and I, I'm not judging the facts one way or the other, I'm just merely determining whether they meet the standard at this point so that they can be passed along to the jury to make that determination. And it seems to me that a jury could conclude uh, that this is torturous and it is something done with evil uh, and evil intent and malice. Um, so move on from that because you're not going to convince me that mm. no reasonable jury could conclude that this is a torturous um, event here in the life of this child. I mean, that is so, 
just me watching this trial, I, I was convinced hearing the boy's testimony, listening to the psychiatrist's testimony, listening to the ring cam videos. Now, I didn't do a whole bunch because we're already almost an hour into this video. That's if anybody makes it to the end of this. I'm not going to change my mind. Like he tried to ask the psychiatrist, do you change your mind if he's just only in there for a few hours? I mean, any reasonable juror, or especially if they're parents on that jury, are going to know this is this is cruel and unusual torture of, and punishment for a child. Well, in terms of the the other elements, you have uh, the argument was malicious, and and in that, I want to also draw the court's attention to Wheeler, uh, which I gave I gave the court the site, but it it there is a clear difference between a parent's discipline and something that goes beyond and results in great bodily harm to to the child. So we don't I don't believe we have that here. Okay, so let me let me read to you a provision that comes out of the case of um, Slocum versus State. That's at seven fifty seven Southern Second twelve forty six. And I'm quoting from that case because I think the the part that I'm going to read is apropos to this. And um, just bear with me for just a second, Mr. Wade, while I get to it. Um, the court said, and this is out of the Fourth District Court of Appeal, which is the court that. Uh, you know, obviously uh, handles direct appeals from uh, this circuit. Regarding another conduct element of aggravated child abuse, the dividing line between permissible punishment and malicious punishment is not always easy to draw. They mute when they a defendant mute maliciously children. punishes a child if the punishment is imposed wrongfully intentionally without legal justification or excuse. The element of malice requires evidence that the defendant acted with ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent. And then the, co the court cites the Gaylord decision where that court made this statement. The determination that a parent or one standing in the position of a parent has overstepped the bounds of permissible conduct in the discipline of a child presupposes either that the punishment was motivated by malice and not by an educational purpose, and that is, was inflicted upon frivolous pretenses, that it was excessive, cruel, or merciless, or that it's resulted in great bodily harm, permanent disability, or permanent disfigurement. And I think that re recognizes that the great bodily harm, permanent disability, or permanent disfigurement is only one aspect of how you get to ultimately a, a, a conviction in an aggravated uh, child abuse case. But the, the, the point I want to make here, and, and I'm going to switch to one other case, and I'll let you have the floor back. And this is the uh, Tate versus State decision. Um, and I'll give you that site. That's at 136 Southern 3rd, 624. Uh, and this is what the court said in Tate, which gives me great pause in, in, in terms of the motion for judgment of acquittal here. And it says, Tate suggests that the state failed to prove that Tate intentionally abused HR, which is similar to what's being argued here. Because direct evidence of intent is rare, and intent is usually proven through inference, a trial court should rarely, if ever, grant a motion for judgment of acquittal on the issue of intent. And they cite a number of cases holding that intent is rarely susceptible of direct proof and is almost always shown solely by circumstantial evidence. And this picks up with what you said. Where reasonable persons may differ as to the existence of facts tending to prove ultimate facts or inferences to be drawn from the facts, the case should be submitted to the jury. So that's why I asked the question the way I did is because if you concede that reasonable jurors and reasonable persons can disagree about what they've seen on the videos and what those videos mean, then that presupposes or I actually mandates that I deny your motion for judgment of acquittal at this point. Do you at least agree with that argument? Well, generally, yes. Uh, my only pushback on that would be that, unlike, I think, in some of the other cases that you've cited, and I've read Tate, is, and I, just reading from reading the case, what I think is different is here, we, the jury has, and the court has, 
not just the video, but the audio. And the audio has the words from Mr. Ferreter himself. And you can see and hear in that that there isn't a, it isn't malicious that in, in the sense that ill will and uh, no, no educational purpose. It's quite frankly the exact opposite. What you see and hear is that he's saying to that you're, you did something wrong and I'm trying to raise you to be somebody who's a good kid, not someone who is out there doing things that aren't good for himself or others and you're not going to, you know, you're going to go nowhere in life. And I want you to go somewhere in life. And there were some clips shown today where he's actually in the room going over homework with Ronan. And there is a lot of conversation about doing homework. And it's every time you see on the video that there is some. All right. He's going to keep trying to hammer it home, but they're not going to give him an acquittal. Uh, the defense is rested. I believe they have rested. That's why he's asking for the acquittal, and the judge says no. No. Do you think a jury anywhere in the land would not, you know, uh, find him guilty? Uh, now, he's innocent until proven guilty, but from what I've seen, if I was on the jury, I would vote guilty. I mean, if you needed somebody at the house while he's at work and his wife is home with little children and then this, this, you know, the young man he was abusing, then they should have hired somebody. He had a million dollar home. Um, that's a something that he has a million dollar home. The, they, these people have money. They could have hired some young, young guy to be a, a, a mentor. At the house, they could have found a church nearby, had the guy coming over, hang out with him all the time. He could have, he probably could have afforded that. I mean, he could have done something like that instead of build a box and throw him in. I mean, the kid just probably needed somebody to, he needed to be monitored. I get it. But there you go. We're going to wrap this up. And I know it went a little long. But it, it was just so much good testimony. I just It was just hard to squeeze it all in there. But anyway, thank you for joining me, if you stayed to the end. And peace out.